Can we trust the creators on YouTube? The sponsored ones. How do we know that they're telling the truth about a camera? There's one camera that's been the big hype since its release last year. The Sony CV-E1. So what is it about this camera? This camera that every creator is raving about. The camera that's supposed to be the best in class. The best camera for creators? What creators? This is a filmmaker's review of the Sony CV-E1. This camera sucks and you should not get it. That's what I told you in my review last year. Let's talk about what this camera can do, what it cannot do, who it's for, who it's not for, and most importantly, why I think that you should get this camera in 2024. But let's first talk about the eight things that I definitely absolutely love about this camera. First of all, the size. This is a small, small, small camera. It's only 399 grams and I love how convenient it is to travel with it, how convenient it is to bring it with me. But there are obviously some actually bad things to it being this small and so lightweight. We'll talk about that later. The second thing that I love about this camera is probably what it's most famous for, and that is the stabilization. Just to have a look at these shots that I made last fall when I was in Tenerife with Norwegian Air. I was on a bike and I did not use a gimbal at all. I was just using the dynamic active function, st stabilization function in the camera. I hate using gimbals, so this is a huge benefit to me. Like th this is something that really changes the game for me in terms of this camera. It's the same sensor as the FX3 and the FX6 and I mean the reason why I got those two cameras was mainly because of the sensor. You have dual ISO 800, 12800, you have 4K log 120 frames per second, all of the good stuff. Then the fourth thing, this is a hybrid camera. We still have 12 megapixels of still photography possibilities with this camera. So when I was on this shoot that I just mentioned, I was taking stills and I was filming like, depending on the situation, what we wanted. The quality of the photos is not amazing, but it's still good enough for social media. It's good enough for a lot of things. So 12 megapixels will get you very far. The ability to have a hybrid like this is obviously amazing, especially if you're on a trip making a lot of content and you only want to bring one camera with you. Okay, so the fifth thing, I guess, that we're talking about that I love about this camera is how well it works with the FX3 and the FX6. I was telling you it has the same sensor, but for me who is using those cameras for everything that I do, being able to use this and match the colors, match all of my color grading like copy paste. As long as I was shooting with the same settings, I can match everything with my other cameras, which is a huge benefit. I love the fact that I can do that. And number six, you can add LUTs to your camera. And I know that this is integrated into a lot of the cameras these days, but it's still something that I really appreciate and I actually did not expect that from this camera. And number seven, this is something that the FX3 and the FX6 actually doesn't even have, and that is an AI technology for the autofocus. So that makes this camera better than any of the other cameras that I have on autofocus. When I was in New York last summer with my girlfriend, we were in this museum kind of thing, ice cream museum, and there were a lot of bananas in the way. And my girlfriend was walking there and the autofocus did not let me down. It was able to focus on her the whole time without the bananas that got in the way affecting the autofocus. Number eight out of the things that I love, the price tag. $2,200 before sales tax in the US. This is amazing for a camera of that quality. As a personal tool and not on the company, it would be a no-brainer. The price tag can't be argued, like it is definitely worth it. And that brings me to the things that I hate about this camera. Let's walk through them. So it is stable. The bad thing about this is that to get that stabilization that the camera provides you, it has to do some cropping. It will kind of take away some of the quality. But then again, the quality of the sensor, 
the quality of the camera in the first place, it's so good. So it might not really be a big deal. But if you're planning on doing a lot of cropping in post, just be aware that this function will do a lot of the cropping before you even get to the post production. Just saying. And number two, speaking of stability, at 100 frames per second, you only get the standard steady shot. You might not need as much of a steady shot or stabilization when you're filming at 100 frames per second, but it's still worth mentioning that you will not get this crazy stability function that the dynamic active is if you're filming at 100 frames per second. I did mention that this is a great hybrid camera, but don't use this as a stills camera only because it doesn't have a viewfinder and to me, that feels like running with my eyes closed. Can a camera that brings this kind of quality be too small or too lightweight? Yes. Because when it comes to client work, it matters. It doesn't matter, but it still matters. With a $30,000 project, the client will actually expect you to bring something bigger, something more professional. They don't know about the specifications of the camera. They expect you to bring a big camera because they're paying you big bucks. If you, just like me, like having a backup for your data when you're on a shoot, the ZV-E1 might give you some issues. With only one SD card slot, you really have to trust the camera and the SD card that you're using. Personally, I would have loved for them to have two SD card slots so I could have one backup card or have one of the CF Express SD card slots just because I trust those cards much more. You could potentially have a monitor on top of this camera, but it would just feel a bit too much because the camera is small and the monitor will be bigger. You would definitely not have a seven inch monitor like the one I have on top of this camera because that would just make the monitor look five times as big as the camera itself. So if you wanna have a monitor on top of it, why not just go for the FX3? And then when it comes to the audio, you might be able to have an adapter on top of it to mount XLRs to it, but then you still have the same issue of it becoming a bit too much on top of it. And you could definitely not mix or having both a monitor and the audio or the XLR adapter on top of it. So I would say that if you're getting this camera, it should be a small rig. You would not rig it the way you would with something like the FX3 or the FX6. And while we're talking about audio, let's not fool ourselves into thinking that the audio on this one, although it's a decent built-in microphone, it's good enough for professional filmmaking. I'm now obsessed with audio and I would never ever use this for anything professional. I wouldn't even use it on my own social media platforms. Again, you can mount an XLR adapter on top of the camera, you'll get better sound, but I'm not sure if that's worth it. And then we have an issue for professional filmmakers and that is the overheating part. I actually have not experienced this overheating even though I've done some interviews with it. I did have Sony even telling me that the camera might overheat, we would not do this for interviews. Like the FX6 will never let me down on that. I have not had problems with that on the FX3. This one, don't trust it, even though it hasn't failed me yet. So it's definitely a camera that adds to my collection with its strengths. And then I'm mainly talking about the stabilization and autofocus, because man, is that amazing. But then again, I was filming these shots of Ari in New York with my FX3, and it's fairly stable, right? So the FX3 is not too shabby on the stabilization. I love making films, and I love making films when I'm traveling. I love having the camera with me everywhere. Being able to travel light is amazing at times, and that's why I love bringing this one with me. And I also have to mention that this is a great behind the scenes camera. So my key points on who this camera is for would be if you don't really care about the audio, you don't need the audio to be recorded at all times, you don't need to have or you don't use a monitor, you don't need to have the camera running at all times, and you don't really care about the risks of only having one SD card slot, and lastly your client doesn't expect you to bring a big cinema camera to the project, then the CV-1 will be your friend. For my friend Ari, who's making a living out of doing inline skating in the streets of New York, this is a beast of a friend. He would just kill it with this one. Who is it not for? 
I make a lot of documentaries, so I need great audio. I need to be able to put my seven inch S, like small HD monitor on top of it. There are things that I need in terms of a professional production that I just couldn't trust the CVE one with. So what question should you ask yourself if you're considering getting this? What kind of productions you're making? Will it fit in your kit? If it doesn't, then I would say this camera isn't for you. In a way, I would say that the more professional you are, the bigger projects, the less this will work for you, the less you will need this camera. So how come I still think that you should get this camera in 2024? I've owned this camera for just about a year and I don't see the day where I would get rid of this. I hate putting my cameras on the gimbal. So this one kind of saves me from the hassle of doing that. And that is one of the main reasons, or it's the main reason why I'm keeping this camera in my camera park. It would not be my main camera, but as a third camera, I'm telling you, it's great. So now, what do you think? Will you get it?